This is Fortress on a Hill with Henry, Kagan, Giovanni, Shiloh, and Manisha. Well, welcome everyone to Fortress on a Hill, a podcast about U.S. foreign policy, anti-imperialism, skepticism, and the American way of war. I'm Henry. Thanks for joining us today. With us is uh, my pal, the legendary Tom Secker from spyculture.com and the podcast Clandestine. And he is here to discuss with me the 1998 war film, uh, Saving Private Ryan. Tom, how are you doing? I'm good, Henry. I'm good. Thanks for having me back on. Uh, this conversation has been quite a while in the making, so I have a feeling it's going to turn into a bit of a splurge of different ideas and opinions that we have about Saving Private Ryan, but I'm looking forward to it. Me too. Me too. It, it is It is one of those films that... Um, well, there certainly is a lot we can say about it, uh, critically, that it does have some very good moments, some really interesting cinematic moments. They're most, mostly moments because they don't fit together whatsoever, but, uh, but the, you can see why the film is, is captivating for people, especially with what, uh, what was done with the first 25 minutes. But of course, we're going to talk about that at, uh, at length today. So, um... When I was a kid, my grandfather, my, my mom's dad, my pop, um, took me to see this in the theater. And I would say that, you know, of, of the films I saw in that era between, let's say, Forrest Gump and The Hurt Locker, that the two that were most impactful on me was Black Hawk Down and Saving Private Ryan. I never really discussed it much with my grandfather as to specifically why he wanted me to see it. But he was in the army between Korea and Vietnam, so he didn't end up serving in either. But I think he wanted to give me an education about what being in the military could be. And so, you know, but it was, it was, you know, th that first 25 minutes as a 16, 17 year old kid make you hold your breath. And, um, and certainly that was what Spielberg was going for. Um, and there is a measure of authenticity to that, um, first bit, but then you get into it and things become much more problematic. The second little history tidbit on Henry about Saving Private Ryan is that there was a point when I was in high school where my history teacher, um, who was a Navy veteran, showed us a little blip of the beginning of Saving Private Ryan. I wouldn't say it was longer than 10 minutes, so we couldn't even have even seen the entire first sequence. Um, but it was, you know, it was appropriate for what we were studying in history at the time. And, um, there were complaints to the school board and they pulled Saving Private Ryan, um, by name, of course, but they pulled just about any other R-rated film that a teacher might've shown a portion of in a, in a class. And so I felt deeply compelled to do something about that. And I wrote a letter to the editor of the local newspaper where I'm from, the Dallas Chronicle. And I just, I expressed my, my dissatisfaction at the other adults, the school board and, and others who complained their, uh, their queasiness about seeing something like that. Because again, especially for American public school, seeing those 10 minutes again, within American, the American side of things could be very informative for somebody, especially wanting to join the military or wanting to understand something about going back there. So anyways, so I wrote a letter to the editor. I have hunted, I hunted high and low trying to find it so I could read a portion of it for today. And maybe I will at some point in the future, if I come across the, the one copy I have somewhere. Um, but I will say is, is that it, it's, it's important for me to emphasize my own being taken in by the film and that it kind of went up on the mental shelf of examples of being in the military examples of being in war and that you know the the many many things many many aspects of a film like saving private ryan that are taken out and looked at on their own and then of course how they are arranged uh together like you know the church scene where the the soldiers the younger soldiers are talking about uh missing their mothers and, and trying to remember them and and the firm understanding that they fully know that tomorrow may be their last day. Um, mm. and it, I, you know, I thought it, that, that part, that part of it, I thought was a beautiful scene. It is, it is, it's certainly, it certainly really drips sentimentality in certain ways. And so, um, but, uh, anyways, 
Um, enough about my experience with the film. Tom, you, uh, you've actually been to the Normandy coast. Tell us about that. Uh, this was on a school trip when I was, I don't know, 11, 12, maybe, um, where we went to Normandy. And one of the places we visited was one of the beaches, uh, where the invasion took place. I'm not going to say which one, but this was a smaller beach. It certainly isn't the one depicted in the film. And to be honest, the whole experience was rather quaint because it's not like in Saving Private Ryan. Obviously, coastline is different in different places. This was quite flat and there weren't any great big bunkers or anything like that. There were a few trenches and ditches and things, and there was the occasional bit of rusted old tank trap left in the sand. So you've got a sense of something happening here. And obviously there's a few plaques and memorials and a little like visitors information center that we looked around. So you got a sense of, you know, this is a historically important location, but ultimately it was just a quite nice beach, which was a slightly odd thing that, because like you studying our history or certainly through the school system, World War II is really important. And so the Normandy invasion is really important. And this is something I must have been told about and seen referenced on television hundreds of times <clears throat> before I ever went there. And the real life experience of just standing there was like, so this is where a major part of a war took place? And actually, of course, it didn't. Not all the beaches were the same. Um, that's one of the things that you, you pointed out in your emails to me. And you're absolutely right. There wasn't a huge amount of action on this particular beach. But nonetheless, it was... It was a great part of one of my favorite trips in my life. It wasn't the best part of that trip to France and to Normandy, but I'd say it was probably the second best. Were you able to, uh, did you get to visit any of the cemeteries that are there? We did. I don't know if we visited them so much as passed them. Um, there's certainly things we saw. I don't remember actually going around them. If you see the distinction I'm making. Yeah. 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 Cause it, the, the one thing we haven't touched on yet is the, the, um, the opening, it's not, it's not really a montage, it's called a montage, but the opening scene with, uh, who we eventually find out is private Ryan himself as an older man visiting, um, graves in Normandy with his family. And it looks like he brought his partners with him, children, grandchildren. This is a very big occasion that this is happening. Um, that the, in, in terms of looking at the way we looking at things, that kind of thousand yard stare that came from the, uh, from, from Ryan and, you know, the rows and rows and rows of graves. And then, and just, they're trying to plug in this veneer of, I, I know they're going for respect, but it, it seems just to me more of a, of a sentimentality that doesn't have a lot of backbone behind it. We want you to get weepy when you see the graves, not when you understand how the graves got there. They, they really put this whole scene on the beach on that plateau in that way. And that's not to say that what happened on that beach wasn't horrific. It was. And the movie does distill a lot of that very clearly. It focuses way too much, of course, on the individual people in it. And that brings us as individual moviegoers into it more than we see in bigger collective actions. That, that opening scene bothers me a bit because, like you say, what are we supposed to feel in that moment? Because we haven't really been introduced to this person. No. And it turns out to not be the person we think it is anyway. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of just pointlessly confusing yeah and as you say the emotional tone of that is just a broad sentimentality there's no real definition to it somewhat sad sure that's about it and why hang the opening of your movie on a scene with so vaguely defined emotional stakes and then cut straight to flashback what appears to be a flashback but turns out it isn't why um, which then launches you into the action. It would have made more sense to me to start with that, with Tom Hanks in the boat, in the landing craft, or at least a big, broad, sweeping shot 
yeah. lots of landing craft approaching the beach and then whatever. Why do yeah. we need that scene in, in, in the graveyard, in the cemetery? Why is it there beyond kind of giving a hook to come back to at the end of the film? Right, <laughs> right. And if it was, if it did go, as you suggested, it immediately began on the beach. If they were to have left in that final scene, it would be much more meaningful that we weren't, one, like you mentioned, we weren't tricked into thinking it was somebody that it wasn't. And two, we are seeing Ryan's story coming full circle for the first time, not some person we don't know who the fuck is at the beginning. It would actually have had a greater meaning in that way. I don't, I would, I would have cut out both of them in, 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 in either case, but at least, at least I could see that. I could, I could see that argument being made about the final one if the first one wasn't there. It certainly would have had more of an impact in terms of you actually caring about this person rather than it becoming, oh, he's the guy in the cemetery. It's more a moment of realization rather than a moment of sympathy with this character, which is presumably what they were going for. It is very emotionally confused that those two scenes bookending the film as to quite why they included them or what they were going for. The whole film's confusing in that respect, to be honest. It um, really is. It really is. I, and the, um, the I, original I never script know. Was, uh, was much more, it just was a greater script. It was just much more honest and open and authentic. It didn't have those open and closing scenes. Tom Hanks' character is much more in line with what you would expect from a wartime army officer. I never know when I'm watching this film what it is that I'm supposed to be feeling. Because aside from lots of little problems, which we'll get to as we go through different parts of the movie, I'm, I, I, it doesn't feel like I'm actually with any of these characters at any moment. It feels very much like I'm watching a film. I always feel a distance to what's happening on screen, even, to be honest, in that opening section. And I get the idea that from a filmmaking point of view, that's supposed to draw you in. And then you're sucked into the movie and then it slows down and we get the actual story. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to be carried through by the effect of that opening sequence. But it never had that effect on me for some reason. Um, and so as a result, the remainder of the film is quite boring. I admire the opening section, certainly, as a piece of, as a piece of cinema, as a piece of making film but it doesn't have the emotional impact on me that I think is intended. And I'm not sure quite what is intended beyond that technique of using the action to suck you in. But there again, if that's the whole point of the opening of the film, why start with the scene in the cemetery? And why pull the whole switcheroo with the characters? It just seems like almost an exercise in keeping the audience guessing at the exact moment that you want them to start absorbing this world that you're creating to start <laughs> feeling part of it and maybe that's why the movie has just never really worked for me whereas it has for so many other people i mean lots of people think that this is a great movie and fine and lots of people get drawn into it and i understand why you did i just never had that reaction from the first time i saw the movie all the way through to the time i rewatched it recently in order to prep for this i, I know I, de I definitely had a a much more romantic notion of being in the military, of combat, of the uh, consequences and the casualties and things like that, you know, and I, I know that that it made made a lot of that, those kind of uh, propaganda films really fit in well for me, and I think that well for the American public because most of our learning is through media. We're not learning. We're not learning extensive non-American. Uh, history that is actually connecting the dots for us on a bigger, bigger scheme than what the American government wants us to know. They want us to, to, to vote and to, to support things by sentiment, not by, um, critical analysis, not by being willing to understand what the actual foreign policy looks like. They want us to go in full in on the, and especially with saving Private Ryan on each of the individual soldiers and that's and that's one of the ways spielberg keeps us going through it is that there's this drip 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 of dead guys from the squad and people are just drawn along with it but again the the sense of collectivism about the fight is totally gives way to all the individuality 
And that's what, you know, that's what, uh, what Spielberg was definitely going for. But you see what I mean? It's, to my mind, the best propaganda is emotionally specific. It doesn't mm. have to be honest, of course, but it sure, has to sure. be aimed at something quite specific that it's trying to trigger in you or maybe lay down so it can then be picked up on later. No, I totally, I totally get the, the, the point you're making that it does it, it, you know, and, and I, I look at it now that way, um, you're much, much years later after having taken in a lot more war films and really looked at the, at the context. Um, but you're absolutely right. Is that that opening scene, it's so, uh, one dimensional and kind of blase. You see that thousand yard stare in Ryan and maybe the audience has an idea of what that's about and maybe they don't, but there's nothing specific, right? It does it, it's not driving towards anything specifically. And then of course there's his family there and they're all kind of, you know, just following grandpa. You know, I don't, you don't see any of them. They don't seem upset or sad to kind of lend us in that direction. Or maybe some of them are frustrated or angry over different dynamics of it. But at the very, le at the very least, it would give us clues to go forward. And there are none. That opening thing, it, it gives us, it gives us nothing other than saying, you know, going to the American notion of, well, not just American, but you know, the, the, the notion of. This, this guy is unsettled. This guy is, you know, this guy is, a, here's our war veteran. Here's our, you know, guy. And you can see in his face, that there's something wrong. Do you know what it really is? No. Could it be nothing? Could he be having bad gas or something? Um, did, but did no, he forget gives, to take his pills this morning? You, exactly. Exactly. No, there is, there's no, there's nothing to grab on in that moment. And so I do totally get you're, you're looking at that and kind of confusion. Why are they? What the fuck is this supposed to be sending me towards? And then you get to the end and you're like, okay, I guess I know what they were going for, but still it, it feels, it feels a bit like cinematic gaslighting, but you really look at it. Yeah. Cause it's a warm open that then drops into a cold open. Right. Right. The film starts twice, essentially. Um, and, and lots of critics, lots of critics in the stuff that I've read online had that same complaint. It was like, you know, that, that. If you had taken between the beach and, um, uh, Ryan's, uh, Ryan's rescue at the very end and cut out the beginning and end, it would have been like a perfect film to them, but they did notice that, you know, what is, why is there this schmaltzy thing attached to this film? Do we not have enough to see what the characters are doing without having this weird intro and outro it also reminds me and i know i bring up this film quite a lot in our conversations but i'm going to do it again anyway of fields of fire the mm. vietnam film that was never made the one uh, written by jim webb because the opening of that film is the father the vietnam veteran who is clearly somewhat disabled and certainly still suffering mm. from his experiences taking his son to vietnam to visit the location of a battle, which we then come back to see later in the film for real. So it establishes, as I say, the emotional stakes, who these people are, what their relationship is, where they're going and why we should care. Mm -hmm. Does not take a long time to do that. It then does go a bit supernatural and he starts to see ghosts and things and that precipitates the flashback. And then as in this film, we then get the story kind of moving forward from there chronologically. But it's essentially the same open, right? The same way of structuring the opening to a movie. And it's so much more effective. And of course, that film got done in by the DOD. I mean, it's largely their fault that it was never made. Whereas this one ultimately got army support of varying kinds. I mean, they didn't provide a lot of hardware because they didn't actually have any World War II hardware left to loan them. So I'm not quite sure where they got all this from, but fair play to them for doing it. Um, and yeah, yes, yeah, like I say, when I was reflecting on why that opening of the movie bothers me so much this time, I was thinking it's because it's the same opening as Fields of Fire, just really badly written. You know, they were going for the same kind of thing, but they just either didn't know how to execute it or didn't care, maybe. There's not a lot of care in that opening either. It doesn't no. feel like a, you know, Spielberg is capable of generating great cinematic moments. Always has been. And yet that scene feels so vague and lazy. And then 
Yeah, like I say, I think of just a cold open where we jump straight. Either we see a big, we get the big picture of the invasion, or just start with a few guys in a boat. Yeah, maybe pull out from there. I don't know. There's, there's so many different ways you could do this that would be more effective than that. Um, but we should move on and actually talk about this great big, is it 24, 25 minute battle sequence that is the thing everyone talks about with Saving Private Ryan, I guess. Yes, yes. So it's important for people to know that, that we have to, we definitely have to take a trip through some important history to understand this, uh, some of this stuff. And also that it, it kind of a curious thing that a filmmaker would choose such a specific place among such a huge battle, um, and concentrate on it. And, and again, you know, got a, a great many of the details, right. And especially as to, you know, veterans that, that saw it when it first came out and talked about, you know, that the, the authenticity was definitely up there, but it, it's a curious thing to, to try to recreate such a specific place because the history can stand there, you know, opposed to you the whole time. Um, whereas if we're watching a movie like platoon that we understand that that script, that, that, um, that Oliver Stone amalgamized different parts of it and put different things together to make it more compelling, not to make it an up today. We're not going to talk about training or deployment of hundreds of thousands of Americans, British, French, and so on, because it, it participated in the evasion, uh, both in the English channel, like Tom Hanks and his pals in the movie, um, huge airborne drops from into Normandy behind enemy lines, massive bombardment of the coastline. Uh, we're not talking about the full picture coastal defenses by the Germans. We're not discussing PSYOPs campaigns by the allies to try to shift German assets in different places. Um, you know, we're not talking about the fact that, you know, truly that four or five deaths in Europe at that time in, in world war two were cumulatively, cumulatively on the Eastern front as the U S only lost about 600,000 troops, Russia lost 27 million folks between military and civilian. What we are discussing today and what you need to center your mind on as, as you're listening to us is that this is one very small section of Omaha beach and they took it and they made this 25 minutes. So everything that I just mentioned, we have to understand that we're not getting the full picture of any of those things. Of course, we're not getting the full picture in the 25 minutes, but it is much more honest than a demonstration of the rest, but it goes back to us focusing on the individuals, on the individual wounds, on the individual arms lost and people blown up, drowned in the, in the surf. And, and of course, all those things happen a horrific, horrific place to be any kind of a human being, much less a troop of some kind on one of those beaches. Um, one other aspect that I'll just, so I don't forget to mention it later is that much like a film like Black Hawk Down, that this film focused on American forces. I don't remember seeing any number of Brits, French. Canadians, um, all of the varying types of people that actually took part in this and, you know, different countries ended up taking full on different, different beaches. Um, but then we move on to the actual scene and the history says that at this particular sliver of sand, that this was the worst casualty wise. It's important to emphasize here that Omaha Beach was the most casualty heavy area of the initial beach landings. What you see in the film, while inaccurate in many ways, does give the viewer a better grasp on how awful that morning was for the invading troops. Why did Spielberg choose this beach? Was he attempting to give viewers a sense of how hopeless or difficult the place really was? Or was it chosen to make a huge action sequence that allowed for only binary assessments of what was happening? Of course, both points aren't mutually exclusive. It can be both extreme hopelessness and a huge action piece that focused on individuals reacting to heavy violence without equally showing the other side. During the Normandy beach landings, that more people died in this small sliver of ground that included Charlie Company 2nd Rangers that was actually captained by a guy named Captain Ralph Bornson. Um, and then immediately to their left, I believe, is Alpha Company. 116th Regimental Combat Team, 29th Infantry Division. And I say that because 
when the scene opens, when they're opening the boats for the first time and Tom Hanks and Tom Sizemore run out there, there are already men from that alpha company dead on the beach. Their company was almost completely wiped out in that section. The Rangers did better, but only a little better. And I don't know to put it on Rangers or just they had good leaders and were able to make the most of the horrifying place. So we possibly have, just dumb luck. Absolutely. No, there, there's, there's so many different factors that can come into it. Um, one thing that Saving Private Ryan didn't include in the front thing was that there were a couple of incidences of friendly fire. That was mainly when uh, naval bombardments, they were able to signal back to British naval ships and get them to uh, provide them air ar ar artillery support. And sometimes those, there were misfirings. There were, they hit places where they were actual allied troops instead of, uh, German troops. Um, and they also, um, the troops on the beaches used white phosphorus grenades to clear out the, the bunkers and pillboxes that the Germans were in. I hope I don't need to emphasize to anybody who listen to this podcast, but I'm, I'm going to anyway, how horrifying white phosphorus burns are. And how even after you've been able to get the fire out, which is a chemical fire, one that can't be put out by water. Um, but it's just a, a horrifying thing. But of course, that one, I could see Spielberg easily saying, we're not going to show that. And certainly we're not going to show that happening to any Americans if somebody missed through a grenade. And even though they do show stuff like that um, throughout the film, that it was, they didn't include any of those kind of things. So we're American centric, doesn't include friendly fire doesn't allow us to know about that other company that is being entirely shredded to bits. All you've just said makes me think this sequence is known for being, or at least in our generation anyway, for being like the definitive depiction of combat in it all is. its horrible, brutal glory, etc. And yet everything you're saying is it's actually quite sanitized. Yes. And quite carefully sanitized to give the impression of exactly what they're going for, which is what Spielberg said. He said this ludicrous thing. It's a, a quote I came across when I was reading, I think it was actually Larry Seward's entry on Saving Private Ryan, which is all right. Um, one of the better entries in his not especially impressive book. Um, yeah, anyway, Spielberg said, you know, there's, there have been, I think he said 84 American films that depict combat in war, and this will be the 85th, and it will be the first one to tell the truth. I'm thinking, you, firstly, you've ripped off this opening from The Longest Day, so that's just bullshit straight out of the can. And I think, really, how arrogant to say that, and then to avoid some of the real chaotic nastiness of what really happened, some of the real, the real horror show. And instead, it's basically just machine guns, lots and lots and lots of machine guns. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, being hit with an industrial machine gun, having your gut shredded by it is not a good thing. But we don't actually see people dying in the way a lot of people died. It's often quite quick, for one thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, You don't see, apart from the guy who actually has his guts hanging out and he's screaming, and there's, you know, there's a bit of that, but it's kept to a relative minimum. We do just see a lot of people getting hit by bullets and now they're dead. Like the idiot who comes along and takes his helmet off and then is immediately mm -hmm. shot. And it's like, that's such a war movie cliche. That's so, I mean, what were they going for with that? Were they trying to make it funny? <laughs> it's almost slapstick given what's going on around them, given all these other people who've died and are dying and are, you know, lying on the beach, missing a leg and, and so on. So yeah, what you're saying is actually rather than being the truth about combat, as Spielberg was promoting it, self-promoting, it's actually quite clean, given what truly happened there. There was a lot of deaths on the day of the invasion that happened simply because the troops were dropped off from their Higgins boat or whatever kind of craft was taking them to the beach, um, that so many of them drowned. You know, they never made it to the beach. And we see that a little bit. We see a few guys struggling in the water. There's, you know, a couple floating in the water, although it's close enough. You don't know whether it could have been gunfire or just the water or a combination thereof. And the stories, the, the little snippets that I've read through uh, doing research for this, 
has almost every guy who gets mentioned saying that they were helping somebody else who was wounded. You know, a guy broke his leg trying to come out of the water. Guy gets trapped under a rock. And mm -hmm. so, so much of the soldier's time on the beach when they're supposed to be moving forward is just dealing with the casualties and, and not even specifically being dealt with by the medics. Um, no, sure. Just being grabbed and dragged around and someone's trying to patch you up. All, all of that. Yeah. So the beach action, it did include a little bit of that. And it did include some of that hopelessness that there was that one dude that Captain Miller drugged for a little bit. And then I think is immediately after he stopped dragging him, he got shot on the ground. And, and that's, you know, like the thing with the, with the helmet, the, you know, the, those things do happen in, in combat, but they are also cliches. They, they are, they fit into the, the, their, they, they think that they're instilling something with wisdom and they're just encouraging lazy writing, you know? Well, that's the thing. It's like everything that actually happens in that opening sequence, give or take, did actually happen. There's all the stuff that also happened that is missing from that opening sequence that undermines it. And I'm reminded of the sequence in Wonder Woman where she goes over the top, mm -hmm. where she's marching through no man's land mm -hmm. and, you know, deflecting all the bullets with a shield. And again, it's a machine gun because it's Germans. And that is perhaps the most iconic action sequence in that film about World War I. Mm -hmm. And it is a complete lie about the true yeah. nature of trench warfare and what going over the top was like. Going over the top, i.e. everyone just piles over the top of the trenches and charges towards the opposition's trench, and most of those people just get cut down, most of those people die, exactly like here. Hmm. And okay, this is a far more realistic film than Wonder Woman, and this is still a far more realistic sequence than that one was, but it has the same troubling dimension to it, that it's taking the mass... I don't want to say suicidal because it's not suicidal, but it's near as damn it being sent on a suicide mission for a lot of those people. Mm -hmm. Taking that and turning it into something simple and heroic that can be overcome quickly. Because that's the other problem with it is that after 25 minutes, they're basically one is scenes and it just sort of stops. And you don't get a sense of, oh, this is just this little part of the beach. There's still a hundred fights going on up and down the coastline and there's still lots of people dying and lots of stuff going on. It just sort of almost goes quiet. And then they get the mission to go off and save Jack Ryan. And that I also find deeply troubling because as you say, this was a very varied invasion in terms of the scale of what was happening on different beaches and which forces were involved and so on. And of course, how many people died and how many people survived. And this, it made it seem like the invasion of Normandy was just Tom Hanks having to blow up a bunker or two. Pretty much, yeah. So again, this is something, it's, it's really morally problematic about it because people take it as being a gruesome, gritty depiction of combat that's actually been kind of squashed into a tiny little ball of what they want you to see that doesn't actually tell you what this thing was like. It doesn't, it's, it's very impressionistic. I think that's ultimately the problem with it, that, okay, the sound design is fantastic. The camera work is fantastic. It's beautifully edited together. But ultimately, does it really give you an impression of suffering and death and the futility of this? Or does it just make you move on so fast that none of that really resonates? When surely that should be the point. And that seems to be the point that a lot of people have taken from it, even though that's not what the film have given them. So I'm left wondering how they ended up with that reaction. I'm very confused people's reactions to this movie being so very different to mine, obviously. Um, and normally I can understand that. But with this one, the more I break down that sequence in my mind, the less I understand why people think it's so iconic for one thing, but also profound. It's actually saying anything about either the Normandy invasions or combat in general. Is it, I mean, are you coming from a different place here? Can you see some kind of moral or statement or something that they're actually trying to say there that I'm just missing? No, no. <laughs> no. there's, there, there just isn't, there's just, uh, that, uh... 
what the Pentagon said about they said it had a nihilistic view of the Vietnam War. I'm starting to wonder, does Saving Private Ryan have kind of a nihilistic view of World War II? That's a good, that's a really good point, man. Even though it's interpreted in a, such a different way to that, that's not how most people see the film and most people remember it. That's how I'm reacting to it right now. Well, one, one thing, I, I, this film would fit into, uh, before my army time, it would fit into a category of films that most people only ever saw once. Mm. And, that, and that was as far as they thought that they could stomach it. And so in, you know, in their remembered reflections of what they got from the movie, I think that it, people are, are filling in more blanks than Spielberg gave them blanks to fill in the biggest effort to me. And I don't know why screenwriters allowed this to happen to their work, but that the original script for Saving Private Ryan was a much better, much more honest and open depiction of what war, war, war was. Um, during that time, um, a couple of good examples that, um, even after the Rangers get off the beach, um, before they are sent to go after Ryan, that in order for them to brief Captain Miller on the mission, they have to literally remove him from combat. He and his soldiers are fighting right there and his soldiers keep fighting while he's briefed. He then goes back, takes the ones that he determines are going to come. And then they end leaving. And then for them, there are no shortage of horrifying events that uh, on their way to try to find Ryan and try to try to bring him back to wherever they were supposed to bring him back to. Um, and so it, it's, uh, and then, and then the final thing, and I think this, this definitely uh, goes to what you're talking about in terms of the, the minimization of really horrifying wartime kind of violence um is the final battle that i think is, is sterilized in very much the same way um w but when you compare it to the original script that sequence of the movie is much much longer you see them take hours and hours and hours preparing the battle space moving rubble around setting up machine guns deciding what angles of fire are the best in the portion we saw in the movie, me, 10 minutes, maybe something, you know, it, 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 a very, very short thing. Um, and then of course there's the ending and the earn this and all that other bull bullshit and such. Um, but it, yeah. it, it, it just looking at how much it was downgraded from the original script. And of course that's the, you know, this Spielberg, this Spielberg special, um, yeah to go ahead and do what he wants and make, and make changes and however he feels, cause he's, he's the God with the Oscars. Um, but it's really important that the, the, that we point out the, um, the sterility of the movie, of the entire movie, there's sterility in the, in the violence and certainly in the more sentimental moments, there's also this sterile sentimentalism, you know, like when. Ryan's mom gets the telegrams and we haven't really talked much about the original story, but we'll, we'll get to that in a, in a little bit. But when in the film, you see Ryan's mom get the telegrams, she gets, of course, gets all three of them at once and you never see her face. She's at this, at the sink, washing dishes. She looks out her window. She sees in the distance, the chaplain's car coming to her home. And of course, once she realizes that of who it is, she sits down on the porch. So I'm sure she's beside herself. If we could see her face. Does she have a face? We don't know. We didn't get to see it. Um, and, and the other thing, and this one, this one hit me much, much harder. Maybe it was because I was a soldier or that it just goes back to older, older parts of me that I'm not noticing right now. But, um, when Ryan, when private Ryan is initially told his three brothers are dead, he falls on the fucking ground and loses his mind. I mean, he is beside himself at the thought that all three of them are gone. We don't see any of that in Matt Damon's performance of Private Ryan. We see a much more manly, hold it in, you know, kind of thing. Um, and it's clear, you know, he loves his brothers, that little story about the bra and the barn and all that shit. And, it, and to be fair, I could understand it at a moment like that, that, you know, you're so 
confused trying, and he's trying to remember his brother's faces and he's not sure at that moment how to do that. But again, it's, it's, that's not the reaction, but Matt Damon's uh, performance is not the reaction of someone who just lost their three siblings. And that can, that whole thing just flattens out over the whole film. Like they're, they're giving us a secondary lesson in, in American male masculinity, in addition to all the bullshit in the film, that you know, this is how tough we're supposed to be instead of understanding that people lose it, people who lose their children in war lose it. And that should be acceptable fair in a film, in a war film, it, it, it should be. Yeah. It's uncomfortable as fuck to watch somebody cry and mourn and lose their mind. And it's supposed to be, that's one of the aspects of war that we do leave out so much. You know, you have your mom with a single tear as opposed to a mom that can't get out of bed for a month because their son is dead or, or something. Or like you say, we don't actually see the face. We just see them face in hands, silhouette from behind, weeping. Yeah. yeah. And then it will quickly fade into something else to not linger on that. Um, so just as they don't linger on the physical suffering in that first sequence in the combat, they don't linger on the emotional suffering, no. which is supposed to be the thing that drives the entire plot. That's the whole reason why we should care about this, right? We want this kid to survive because he's the only son left. We want this woman to get her only surviving son back. And yet, again, they never introduce her, really. We don't get to know her. We don't get to know why her son matters to her so much. I mean, we're just sort of left to presume all of that. And like you say, when they eventually actually get to Jack Ryan, I keep calling him Jack Ryan, but I'm going to keep doing that anyway. Um, <laughs> I know that's not his name in the film, but when we eventually get to him, his emotional reaction is neither one of shock and shutting down, nor one of exploding and falling to the ground, like you say, in the original script. So quite what are we supposed to make of the emotional through line to the entire movie? And how is that supposed to link up with the bookends that we've already discussed? Given that Spielberg was evidently trying to make that kind of film, I think he screwed up, basically. Um, I think he missed what the emotional beats in this movie were supposed to be for that story to work. And cheated the audience out of both a realistic, truly realistic depiction of the combat at Normandy, particularly that bit of the beach, and kind of cheated them out of the rest of the film too, because it's, as I said, he ripped off the start from The Longest Day, the rest of the film, and he's quite open about this, he ripped off from a film called A Walk in the Sun, which is about a small group of American GIs in Italy, I think, who are looking for a bridge they have to blow up. So it's just them, like in most of, of uh, Saving Jack Ryan, um, just traipsing across the countryside, talking about stuff, and then things happen. Um, but why try and make both of those films at once? Make one or the other. Or, as you say with the original script, if you are going to do it, have it like that. Have it that they're kind of pulled out of combat. So you get the sense that the fight is still going on on the beach, and then as they move away, they engage in more of a fight. They discover, you know, there's just sort of random chaos bits of war going on all around them and they're trying to move through this that's presumably what they were going for even with the toned down and sanitized version but it's not what we ended up with what you end up with is something that's sensorily overwhelming that then goes quiet and then gets a bit dull for quite a while because as i say how are we supposed to care about all of these people when we haven't been introduced to them and we don't really know who they are or why all of this matters? The person that we really are supposed to care about is the mother back home, who we hope will one day get to see her son again. But we spend no time with her because nope. the only women in this film are either typists or a mother who we never see her face. Because this is a very, very sexist movie in that respect. Yeah, it's like a Michael Bay movie. The women are there to cry and be an emotional anchor point, and that's about it. It really, it really, uh, it really lends itself to uh, American and British military notions about women in combat. Mm. About you know, because we could tell, we could you know, they could include those kind of things. They could include you know, nurses that happen to come ashore 
with the medical teams sometime later on. And it's for some reason, there's fresh fighting going on nearby and they can go over it. I read about this. I read about all kinds of things like that. No, there weren't, uh, there weren't women specifically on the beach, but there were women everywhere else in that. There were women loading bombs. There were women, you know, as part of the, um, like you said, a big part of the medical, medical crew there. And they could have included those things and they chose not to. It just, you know, that there, there are, there are so many great stories like that in, in American and British history about women going, you know, and I, I don't want to, I don't want to go over to the, to the combat worship side of it, but just in terms of the survival of a human being against amazing odds and being helpful at a time when society said women shouldn't be in combat around combat, near combat, they might get scared. They might get this, whatever bullshit they happen to throw out at that point. They can be every bit as good as men and being warmongers. There is no reason to, to not do that. And it's, it's their own lack of imagination of including that. And especially like you mentioned about Spielberg and his many, the many cliches and things that he borrowed from places, um, begins to make you wonder if he ever writes anything truly original, but, uh, that would be a long subject for a different day. <laughs> it would also involve watching all of his films again and concluding the answer to that question is probably not. Yeah. Um, especially yeah. after Ready Player One, which is just a mashup of all his pre-existing films and some other stuff that he likes. <laughs> Have a Str strange guy. Spielberg. He really is. He's a, yeah, he did. He, um, uh, I, I think the, the best thing that he's ever made in my mind, and of course he was only executive producer of it, but my favorite Spielberg thing is Animaniacs. That, uh, that, that, that is where I put it because that's some good stuff. And he didn't write it. He just was the, he was just the dude on the executive producer thing, you know? So, but good show. Good show. No, no, Animaniacs um, was great. Yeah, yeah, no, I can see that. <laughs> I just wasn't expecting you to make <laughs> So I want to, I want to key up on one thing that happened and in, this goes right to, I think, to the heart of what you're discussing here, Tom, about, about what characters find importance and how do we make our attachment to that? Mm -hmm. Ryan's comment right after meeting Captain Miller and hearing the whole spiel and wanting to take him home and Ryan retorts to the captain. He says, you can tell her, my mom, when you found me, I was with the only brothers I have left. Now for, from a, a real simplistic soldier kind of standpoint, I could understand him, him saying like that, but his brothers were literally just killed. He's a member of the 101st airborne, which means at that point where he was, if we're to take all of that at face value, he had already seen a whole host of death and destruction. Why is it that he would place such stock in his comrades lives, knowing that his own brothers were just killed? This same way, why would he say anything lofty about the value of life when life at that point that he was living so, so fucking cheap? Um, is it a, is it a, uh, you know, kind of a, a front, you know, we're putting one foot in front of the other. And that is our retort to say, again, is the, the theme here totally lost in the sauce in terms of where that's supposed to go, you know, him falling on his knees and crying, hearing about his brothers, people can relate to people can grab onto, but mm -hmm. if you're going to, if it's always going to fit into that male centric masculine presentation, John Wayne with the helmet and the cigar, um, then we're not going to get any closer to the real reality of the emotions in times like these. Oh, and, and that's the other thing about the conclusion of the film that I think was a sincere fuck up on Spielberg's part is that when Ryan ultimately gets rescued, when the Mustangs fly overhead and bomb the bridge and push back the Germans and everything, there is nothing to say that Ryan couldn't have died 10 minutes after that or 10 hours after or 10 days after, mm. um, remembering that all of those guys that came to rescue him died and he was left by himself. Now, of course, if there's, if there's allied air power overhead, that may mean that ground forces are not far away, but that doesn't guarantee it in any instance. So I feel like that by moving immediately from that point back to our sterile ce uh, cemetery and, and Grandpa Ryan trying to deal with his thousand yard stare and everything, um, that there's something missing. There. There's something that, you know, and it, it, how, how did he fucking get home? 
even a short, very short little montage sequence of riding in the back of the truck, back to the beaches, getting on a boat, going back across the channel, and then eventually making it all the way back home. Um, at least that could have given us a connection and understanding that his war, his portion of the war was truly done right there, but it didn't, it didn't give us anything close to a period on what was actually happening there. And that whole area, everything about the Normandy beaches, about the allies movement inland towards, um, bigger German forces was all very tentative. There was, there was nothing to say that the Germans wouldn't be come back in a much greater force. But the film firmly tells us we're stopping right here. Here's where the fucking story ends. What other story there is? Well, you know, whatever people are thinking, some people will be like, okay, well, I'm, I'm glad the movie's over. I don't have to go through that shit anymore. And some other people who would have been, you know, more World War II knowledgeable, you know, would have in their mind, okay, I guess he's going home now. They don't have to explain that, but that's not the nature of war. And so it's, I think that's, that's a really big, another missed beat along with a lot of the other stuff that we've been, we've been talking about. Yeah. Cause like you say, the reason why we're supposed to care about the people we're following through this journey, rather than seeing a wider scale movie that, as you say, could keep moving back to the beach and show that this is still going on as these guys are gradually making their way across the countryside and trying to find Ryan, that there is still a war going on all around them. And there is people dying constantly. But they didn't make that film. They made a walk in the sun, a, a small group of guys. But if you want to have a small group of guys, your opening half hour to the movie probably shouldn't be everyone but your small group of guys getting shot. Right. It should probably be a conversation, maybe, between your small group of guys, establishing who the hell they are, so we can care about them. And then they try and do that. That all seems to sort of happen in the second act instead of the first. So again, the movie is sort of restarted once more. Um, right. Third beginning now, just keeping score. Um, and, and that's when we start to get to know these guys. For one thing, it seemed like they just slapped everyone who was hot in the late 90s into a World War II army uniform and stuck them on the screen. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the characterization was done that well. They don't really stand out to me. I don't remember anyone in this film apart from Matt Damon and Tom Hanks, particularly. Maybe that's just me. Maybe other people feel differently. But even if that is what they were going for, and even if they accomplished that part of it, and some people may feel that they did, it gets very confused by all of these different things saying, oh, no, but the individual doesn't matter. Your relationship to individual soldiers fighting in this war is irrelevant. Mm. And yet the ending of the film is all just this one individual survives. And as you say, he says this line about my, my family brothers, my blood brothers are gone, but these are my new family, my new brothers. And they all die. So, <laughs> like, what, how is that line supposed to have much emotional resonance when, okay, his first family's dead and now his second family's dead? Why does it even matter whether he survives at that point? Let alone the question of how does he survive, as you say. He's still in the middle of a war. And the notion that, oh, that's the end of, I mean, didn't he just like parachute in the day before or that morning? Or, you know. Right. It, didn't, it didn't seem like that was his whole mission, was to parachute in, get blown off course, and then get rescued. Um, I, I assume he had some other business that he would have to attend to before they just let him go out of France. Um, yeah, the whole, I mean, the whole premise of the film is screwed. Because the notion that they would send off people in the midst of all of this to go and find one guy. And I know you've got some notes just to go through on, like, real life stories that may have inspired this or certainly I think did inspire this. This, just to say, this is one of the things that the US Army had a problem with themselves is they said the premise of the movie is kind of screwed, not just because you open with Ryan, but then we're following Tom Hanks. So we assume Tom Hanks is the old guy at the end of the film, but then he dies. But Ryan was never on the beach. So the whole flashback thing doesn't actually follow through. They were criticizing. Yeah. That's the US Army who said they had a problem with it. Um, and they also said the premise of sending off a bunch of guys to track down one soldier in the midst of a war, which is encompassing many hundreds of thousands of people, many, many tens of thousands of whom are 
basically just dying every moment, doesn't make any sense either. And we wouldn't have actually done this. And there is also the whole problem of how does the news get to the mother so quickly? I think there's actually one of the script notes says, well, they didn't have email or faxes in 1940. <laughs> so that was just physically impossible, let alone the notion that them all arriving at once, which is extremely unlikely. Um, you know, they, even they were picking holes in this very stupid script. Um, but yeah, it, it's particularly that through line of, does the individual matter? Because the film's sort of saying it does, but undermines that at almost every turn. And do the bonds of battle matter? It's saying yes, but undermines it at every turn. So what actually matters? What are we left with except Guy in Cemetery? That's pretty much it. And I, I, I think that kind of circular logic, the schmaltz of the beach and everything, it, it really fits well in other, among other American films about, you know, American centric thinking about our military and what it does. Um, but it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's very much, you know, as, as you're saying, you know, this individual matters, they die. That individual matters. They die. Um, and, and, and nothing else better is, comes from that. And, and I'm really glad that the army and that soldiers pointed that kind of thing out and it, it about, you know, sending, sending a bunch of guys to kill and die for one, one person. And Spielberg said the same thing. He said he wanted to demonstrate the, um, the futility of what it was they were trying to do not just the actual mission, but the idea of sending that many, you know, sending that many people ostensibly to die for this one dude to come home. Um, but the thing is, is our mythology, American mythology in that way does attach itself really well to that. You know, the, one of the, I don't remember if it was the code of conduct or which, which army thing you're supposed to resuscitate ab about this, but where it mentions leave no man behind. And, you know, the, the whole, you know, if, if, if we were to take Black Hawk down as being a, a second chapter of, of Saving Private Ryan, you would see, you know, this repeated choice for military leaders to say, I'm going to send a whole bunch of people to stop a very few people, or I'm going to spend a whole bunch of people to rescue a very few people instead of cutting, you know, cutting their losses and saying, I'm sorry, we can't, it makes no sense. There is no sense to it. Uh, but again, like you're pointing out here is that Spielberg did it so much throughout the film that the, there is never anything concrete to grab onto in that way. Um, but, um, let's, um, uh, let's move on if, a little bit. If anything, that'd be the most, the most powerful emotional beat that I felt in the film is in the, um, the wrong private Ryan scene. Mm -hmm. That was, that find... was a good one. That was a powerful one. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's how. It should actually be when they find the real Ryan, yeah? And totally. it's the wrong one. It's a scene that doesn't need to be in the film and is, in fact, a bit of a waste of everyone's time. They probably could have left that out and just move the fuck on with the story. But then they're actually missing the only emotional beat that landed in the entire film for me. So I get that no matter what they did, I would have criticized it. But you, you see what I mean? He managed to create, in that moment, greater emotional depth with a character that has no bearing on the plot, he's just no. got the same name and someone makes an administrative mistake, than he did in the entire rest of the movie with the characters that we're supposed to care about, such as the mother, such as Tom Hanks, such as Matt Damon. How did he manage to create a greater emotional anchor with an entirely tertiary, irrelevant character that, as I say, could just be written out and no one would miss him than he did with the actual story he was trying to tell? I think maybe he got lost in the notion of futility. If he was trying to say yeah. that this was futile, I mean, firstly, that begs the question, why make the film, Stephen? Um, if your story is ultimately futile, maybe don't make it. But also, if you're trying to depict futility, you need to see the struggle of the people who are trying to do something futile, which means ultimately you do need to relate to their struggle. Right. Otherwise, you just end up with a kind of cold emotionally flat film that doesn't really go anywhere and starts by saying the normandy landings were over in about 20 minutes 
and finishes by saying we won World War II by saving or and or blowing up one bridge. Mm-hmm. And it's quite a small bridge as well. It's not like we're talking about the bridge over the River Kwai here. It's That was another thing that puzzles me about that ending. It's so small scale. They're trying to make this the big climax of the film, but it's just like one little bridge that you know, you could probably rebuild that in about two days if you really wanted to. Probably faster if you get some Army Corps of Engineers in there or something. Um, and yet Tom Hanks makes this his last stand. Why? Yeah. Why does he care? Why should we care? Sorry, you wanted to move on to something else. <laughs> please, please oh, do, because um, I'm just ranting about how little I care about this movie. Um, so we need to talk a little bit about the real um, basis for the story of, of Saving mm. Private Riot. And of course it is, it is only one aspect that is a, among many other aspects from many other films, ideas that um, get input in here. But the, the real story is quite different, but I, th- I think it's, a, it's an important one to put alongside. Um, mm. So a partial basis for this story is the tale of the Nyland brothers. But the, before we come to them, we need to first talk about the Sullivan brothers. The Sullivan mm. brothers were five biological siblings who enlisted in the Navy after Pearl Harbor and were assigned together on the USS Juno, which was part of the U.S. Pacific Fleet. George, Francis, Joseph, Madison, and Albert Sullivan. The Navy agreed to the request that all five would serve on the same ship. It wasn't a common practice by the U.S. military to place siblings together, but it wasn't discouraged either. Some officials saw it as a way to keep family morale high. In fact, at least 30 sets of brothers were serving on the Juno when it sank. Um, It was sunk by Japanese torpedoes in 1942 with no known survivors. And so the fallout from the deaths of the Sullivan brothers led to significant changes in policies at the uh, the War Department about siblings or close relatives being stationed together. Um, Now, this was prior, prior, you know, this was the War Department before it was changed to the Department of Defense, mind you. At this point in World War II, the Sullivans were, of course, only one very small portion of sibling groups who had died together. So the War Department created its own sole survivor policy. It was this policy that affected the Nyland brothers, um, Edward, Fritz, Preston, and Robert Nyland. And then their postings among American forces were a direct result of this new policy. One was assigned to the U.S. Army Air Corps in the Pacific, while the other three were assigned to various infantry units in the European theater. In fact, um, three of them were stationed in England at the same time in preparation for the Normandy landings. Um, although because they were in different units and preparing for different missions, they didn't actually have much contact with each other while they were in England, still getting ready for the invasion. In May of 1944, Edward Nyland was shot down over Burma and was declared missing, believed to be dead. Next on June 6th, 1944, the first day of the Normandy landings, the three brothers, um, each participated in the landings, albeit in very different places. Robert was killed in action on the sixth, uh, on, I want to say on one of the beaches. And then on the seventh, the same fate befell Preston and the last brother, uh, Frederick or Fritz, as he was called, was missing, having jumped in with the 101st the night prior to the invasion. Well, I'm going to. Next part, I'm going to quote a little bit here from Band of Brothers by Stephen Ambrose. And he is what was for the long time, one of the main historians around some of this stuff, a very prominent one, but also a very U.S. centric one. Quote, the previous day, Nedlin had gone to the 82nd to see his brother, Bob, the one who had told, told Malarkey in London that if he wanted to be a hero, a hero, the Germans would see to it fast, which had led Malarkey to conclude that Bob Nyland had lost his nerve. Fritz Nyland had just learned that his brother had been killed on D-Day. Bob's platoon had been surrounded and he manned a machine gun, hitting the Germans with harassing fire until the platoon broke through the encirclement. He had used up several boxes of ammo before getting killed. Fritz next hitched a ride to the 4th Infantry Division, and this is all, of course, is, is post-landing. Um, mm. And 4th Infantry Division positioned to see another brother who was a platoon leader. He, too, had been killed on D-Day on, U- on uh, Utah. By the time Fritz returned to Easy Company, uh, which he was part of Easy Company, uh, what is it? 2nd Battalion, 506th Infantry Regiment. Um, 
By the time he returned to the company, Father Francis Sampson was looking for him to tell him that a third brother, a pilot in the China, Burma, India theater, had been killed the same week. Fritz was the sole surviving son, and the army wanted to remove him from the combat zone on the same day. Father Sampson escorted Fritz to Utah Beach, where a plane flew him home, flew him to London on his first uh, leg uh, return to the States. And he actually served stateside as an MP until the end of the war. And so obviously Saving Private Ryan diverges from this super fucking strongly, um, keeping only the deaths of the three brothers in close succession and the quote unquote rescue of Ryan by the army. Although the rescue, if we're to call it one at all, was very different in reality. Um, the survival of Edward after his release from the POW camp wasn't included in any way in the final film or the journey Fritz took to find his brothers after the initial DD landings. Um, and of course, no soldiers were sent individually or as a unit to bring back Fritz to inspiration for saving private Ryan. I don't know about you, Tom, but I would have found a movie that told the story of this brother Fritz going to find out about his brothers by himself. My would have made a much better film and a much more authentic film than anything that Saving Private Ryan can can spit back at us, um, you know. And and it it and this is how it happened. The the hero of the matter, if there's to be a hero, was a chaplain, someone who you know he wasn't part of the fighting or anything, but recognized what was happening and took it upon himself. I think he actually turned the packet of paperwork into his command on behalf of uh, of Fritz in order him to be able to go home i mean would I, I can't imagine that anybody on the normandy side of things would consider wasting time on something like that when they're having mm. to with actual battleship i totally agree that sounds like a much better film not just because it's a real story but because it's a better story it's i mean okay that's quite that would actually be quite difficult to write nonetheless it's evident that they picked up on stories like this one, possibly that family in particular, as the basis for Saving Private Ryan. And yet, they missed the opportunity to make Ryan the central character, right. I guess, is, is partly where they went wrong with that. Just from a storytelling point of view, again, they needed to establish Ryan earlier on. And if they were telling that story, about that family, presumably Fritz would be in the opening reel of the film. Correct. He'd be established quite early on that he could establish the relationships between the brothers. They could maybe establish the chaplain quite early on in the film. Yeah, you could tell a so much better story while still having the war going on around them, while still having it depict action and combat and, if you want, the futility of it. Certainly the chaos and the noise and the cinematic side, but still tell that particular kind of a story where it's more tightly focused. I mean, that's another problem with Saving Private Ryan is there's kind of too many men in this troop that they send off. If they just sent off a couple of guys and it's about their relationship, or at least that part of the film is about those two guys and some kind of back and forth, but it isn't. Mm -hmm. It's about Tom Hanks and some people. So you see what I mean? If you pack too many people into that group, you don't give any of them enough time to breathe, so you don't ever get to really know them. Whereas in the story that you're, you could establish all of those people well enough that the ones that die, their deaths matter, and the ones that survive, their uh, mission, their sense of purpose, their journey matters. Instead of this kind of meandering not quite sure what this film is about, not quite sure who is this guy that they're looking for. Maybe he's dead anyway. <laughs> Maybe that would have made for a better film if they eventually get there and <laughs> Jack Ryan's dead. And the whole I mean you want to talk about story of futility, tell that story. Right. Yeah, we've talked um, we've talked about that point before. Yeah, definitely. Um, so No, you're right. You're right. Real life is always better. And that is actually quite an amazing story from Normandy from World War II because yeah that's kind of an amazing thing to do particularly in the midst of a war right particularly when there's a million other things pressing on you at every moment um for people to find that sense of I guess caring 
to find it within themselves to actually give a shit enough to just help someone out like that when you don't have to. You know, yeah, that chaplain. I don't know who they could get to play him, but yeah, yeah, that that would have made a really nice movie. I think so, I think so too. I think it would be a, a a very interesting perspective, especially in American war films. Which, if if a chaplain's there, it's because somebody's dying or dead. That's that's the only reason that that chaplains fight alongside and they have a much greater role in that in that way. Um, They're there to a, make death sacred, basically. Yes, 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 absolutely. Um, in this, it's more about in the story you're telling. It's more about making life sacred, right? which is not a point that ever gets made in Jack Ryan, even though the whole film is supposed to be about the survival of one man and why that should matter. Spielberg got very confused when writing this. He really did. The writing he, of this movie. Maybe his spoke dealer was off that week. Yeah. Was, uh, um, so there's a, a second historical part of this that I want to mention real quick, and mm. it has to do with the use of what's called the Bixby letter in Saving Private Ryan. And it, this letter was written by either by President Lincoln or Lincoln's personal secretary to a mother who was believed to have lost five sons in the Civil War. And the local local politicians and the governor in Massachusetts, they put in the request to, for Lincoln to to write this letter. And it, 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 it's beautiful, but it's also honest. Um, you know, he talks about how we how we can fruitless any words of mine might be to comfort you in a moment like this um but it it's i feel like that it doesn't feel right for um the movie because because again we're getting into we, we we finally found a limit to our futility tom and it's called saving private right you know yeah. um and i think that that in addition to the whole earn this thing they almost feel like fourth wall breaks. It almost feels like Deadpool should be showing up and cussing at us in these moments because that's kind of how the moment seems to feel. Um, and I, I have a lot of questions about that whole scene with the chief of staff, you know, General George Marshall, who was chief of staff of the army during World War II. And of course is a very famous and beloved general uh, here in the US. Mm -hmm. um, that uh, would George Marshall have time at what is it two days after after d-day after the landings to have enough information to actually know that this has happened and then to actually be able to order an individual group a single squad of soldiers to go and do something about it um and and th there's a there's a bit of back and forth there's the other officers there dale die is in that scene and he mentions about all the airborne misdrops and how you may be sending your guys to on a wild goose chase, some of the only uh, outside pushback in the movie. Of course, the soldiers going talk about it a little bit, but very seldom are we hearing anybody higher up and Captain Miller saying anything about it. Um, but the 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 idea of losing five sons, or in the case of Mrs. Ryan having lost three sons and one son come home, for the military and the kind of combat operations and and conflicts that American personnel end up these days that it, it we just can't fathom and, and they don't even try anymore. Film workers don't even try to help us fa fathom the scale of what some of these things are. And I think that they say to themselves, okay, we're going to focus on an individual and he'll have the values that we're trying to get across whenever st stupid army bullshit is going on, you know, mm -hmm. um, but it, I don't know about you, but the idea of using it, granted, it, I, I can't, it feels like they're trying to give us so much fake grief that it becomes just farcical. It doesn't feel real anymore. It doesn't feel like something that we can attach on to. You know, we hear five guys, this mom lost five sons. And it's like the emotion of it, you almost want to take a deep breath. That's what they're counting on. It's not about understanding the, you know, the real futility of it. Why didn't, you know, they could have talked about that in the movie. Uh, George Marshall could have talked about how many different pairs or brothers died in this movie. They could lay that on really thick. Hey, I've got a, a, a stack of files over here that says all these families no longer have sons. Yeah. So let's try to get this one back. 
And like you said, anything like that is absent from this shit. It doesn't, it doesn't give it to us. So they say, okay, well, we'll just wrap it all around one asshole. We'll just say he's going to be the one asshole and we'll see if people care about him. And obviously the, the film really doesn't teach us to, it teaches us to, to tokenize him, to see his service as something to place on a pedestal. And of course, as we all know, when we place things on pedestals, we begin to forget parts of them. They often become more mythological than factual or historical. Mm -hmm. And that's what America wants people to do with soldiers. They want us to look that way. You know, soldiers are, and especially wounded and dead soldiers are forms of currency that politicians can use to bring into the state of the union. They, all kinds of different things that they can be performatively, um, appealing to those people that really care about that, or at least say that they really care about veterans at the military or et cetera. Sure. sure. Well, the thing about that, that letter, I mean, that's just why. Why bother with that unless the whole attempt is to create a kind of sense of this is, I guess, an inevitable part of the American mythology, something like that? What, mm -hmm. what, what exactly are they even trying to evoke? But this happened during the Civil War. Yeah, the Civil War was a fucking horror show. Yes, um, it was. Yeah, a lot of people died, and you could say that was fairly futile. Um, or a lot of it was anyway. But w why does that matter in this moment? Again, it's like the sort of dragging in all of these little things from outside, from the bigger picture, without actually ever giving us that big picture or saying why we care about this. It's just like, oh, we want to evoke something, we want to give an impression of something. Oh, this is, this is Americana. This is the American experience. Well, for some people it is, yeah. Uh, so what? I mean... Like what, what, what next? What's the end of that sentence? Um, and as you say, why not have the general, if he's apparently this well informed this quickly about all the people who are dying and who they're related to, uh, surely he would be on top of this. Surely mm -hmm. he'd be aware that this is actually happening left, right and center. And as you say, they could use that as, you know, that's just the moment he says, no, we're going to, we can't do anything about this massive stack of files that are all about you know, three dead brothers, four dead brothers, five dead brothers, but we're going to make this one matter. And you could even have a great 1980s style moment where someone says, why? And he goes, because we can. <laughs> even that cheesy, but would have been better than what they did. Having a guy who just sort of decides, I'm in a position to decide this, so I'm going to. Such. There's never any sense of this being a, a moral mission. No. Because it's so confused and implausible. As you, said, you, you used the phrase earlier about it being cinematic gaslighting, and it is like that. It's sort of, oh, this guy's life really matters. But does it? Oh. So we're going to send these guys off to find him because, you know, the, the, the bonds between people who've served together and fought together means that they'll get it, but they don't get it. And actually the captain of that, or leader of that troop, thinks the whole thing's kind of stupid doesn't understand why he's being sent off on this mission at this moment. Every time they offer you something that you could latch onto, they then take it away again. To the extent that it almost feels deliberate. It almost does feel like someone is deliberately manipulating and just teasing you with this so they can then go, nope, and slap you in the face again. And again, from a filmmaker who's usually so good at identifying what are the emotional anchors? What are the emotional beats? What is this story actually about on a basic human level? And with this film, he seems to have got distracted trying to do something else, or he's done it in this really weird way deliberately, thinking, as long as I give enough impressions of emotional beats, people will fill in the blanks for themselves. Because yeah. people are so prepped going into this by all of the documentaries on the History Channel about World War II, by all the stuff in the mm -hmm. classrooms, by all of the I don't know, parades and razzmatazz and everything. They're already conditioned, preconditioned to see in this film what I want them to see and have the reaction I want them to have, almost regardless of what I actually put up on screen for them. Um, even if I base this whole thing around a central character who you think is going to survive but actually dies, and another guy who does survive but we never get to meet him until about two hours into the movie anyway, so why the hell should anyone care? <clears throat> you see what I mean? It's this constant rug pull of anything that could 
be considered deep or profound or even a clear statement. What the hell does this film even say about itself, about its own story? The main character in it tells us the whole story is stupid and the premise is fucked. Is that not Spielberg? No, con- is that not Spielberg kind of confessing that this isn't a very good? There's a Tom Hanks of all people. Up there oh, I know, it. I know. This film is fucking stupid. Yeah, I'm starring in it, and it makes no sense. There's a. There's also there. There's something about the title that I think lends itself to to pointing to a lot a lot of what we're we're talking about here in the the talking about saving anything because in addition to the the rescue kind of saving as in what they're trying to do here that um saving i think applied it to two other areas one christian uh invocation you know in terms of that that we're doing we could be doing god's work if we're trying to save private ryan you know that that's the best thing to do that's what god would want us to do i think that there's 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 some of that in there um but there's also about mom there's also about Mrs. Ryan. Does the title and the notion of quote unquote saving Ryan to save his mother further harm? Um, cause even, cause we do talk about that a very little bit, but not very much. I feel like all of that, it, it, it really rings false. It, it, it's attempting to kind of mythically lift up, uh, a gold star mother. And I, I, I don't agree with that saying, but everybody knows what I'm talking about when I, I mentioned it. Um, in a way that ordinary people, non-military affiliated people, maybe people who aren't World War II history buffs, that they can appreciate that we, like, right now the United States is contemplating big moves towards Iran because of the two, um, or excuse me, three Army Reserve soldiers that were killed in, uh, in Jordan recently. Yeah. Um, three dead people. And they're ready to go kill a few thousand more. That is that, you know, that when we were, if we're to really look back at World War II, and this of course comes across too in Vietnam and other big, bigger things, that most people never really attach themselves to how horrifying it really was. I remember reading a story about a guy working on an airfield I think, I don't know if it was in France, but in World War II, where a plane comes in and crashes and that because of the design of the plane, the guys that are underneath, like the bombardier or the navigator or whatever, they get crushed to death and set on fire. And the guys standing on the side of the airfield, listening to it, listening to these Mm -hmm. people burned alive. And again, these are their pals. The aircraft crash did not come as a result of enemy, enemy, anything. It's just there and there's no sense to be made of it. There isn't, it's just a horrific thing, Mm. but we only, you know, like we're talking about the sterilized, you know, opening scene and, and, you know, not including some of this stuff is that it had to be so terrifying, but there was a, there was a firm, firm ceiling in that, like we were mentioning earlier that, um, it won't go past that. And that makes it easier for people to mythologize it. It's like when them cutting out cursing out of military movies that somehow people, you know, uh, conservative Christian folks will watch those kind of things. And because mm-hmm. there's no cussing, it doesn't bother them as much because they've been primed to care far more about cursing than they have about mass violence or re- the real reality of anything. So I felt like it's, it's holding up this, this mom and we do feel for her. We, and I think that we should, um, but are we sending her to a place where no one understands what the fuck is going on with her, that we have to treat her like an angel floating in the atmosphere and not a real literal person who lost her sons and still has to try to go on living. And this is a point you've made in our emails when we were back and forth being, I'm going to pick this one out, is that an awful lot of the emotions in this film give way to spirituality. Yes. So rather than keep them grounded, as you say, in human beings, which help people empathize, because, you know, human beings can empathize with one another, especially when they see something of themselves in the other person that they're, yeah. Um, <laughs> this stuff isn't complicated. No. <laughs> um, also, in the way that 
the overall narrative, which is not so much a, a saving of Private Ryan or a rescuing of Private Ryan, but seemingly an attempt to save World War II from its own futility, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is underpinned by this Christian or Judeo Christian religiosity or spirituality. Like I've got in my notes here, 21 minutes in. So after we've had about 20 minutes of the big battle sequence, everyone starts finding God. The sniper starts muttering his, his Jesus stuff to himself. Mm -hmm. And there's some other, if not necessarily religious, certainly religious feeling moments. They're like religious experiences going on. And then they all start committing war crimes. They start executing prisoners of war. They start executing people who are unarmed and have surrendered. There's the bit where uh, they're all burning in the bunker. And he says, don't shoot, just let them burn. When the mm -hmm. main thing would be to just shoot them and kill them, put them out of their suffering at that point. So it seems that, if anything, the through line of this film is a kind of religious vengeance, maybe. Mm -hmm. Uh, or certainly that's how that opening sequence plays out. And it comes back at the end. You know, you have the sniper up in the tower who gets shot by the tank. Um, and he's doing the same thing again. He's sort of muttering, not necessarily biblical verses to himself, but something of that nature as he's shooting people. Um, that's odd in a film like this, particularly when the enemy are mostly white Christians. Mm -hmm. Of course, we never really get to meet any of the Nazis or talk to them very much. So no, no. Germans are really even considered human beings in this film. There's, but, there's also the, the huge inclusion of peoples that they had uh, captured and were forced into being part of the German forces. Please get over Polish, Romania, all kinds of different places. And that was a good portion of their replacements that were working in Normandy at the time. And of course, like you said, all we see are white, German of uh, bad guys. We don't see anybody that could show us some, some other aspect of that. It's just exactly what we would expect to see. And so ultimately, is this movie not an emotional tale of human beings at all, but fundamentally a spiritual myth about a futile war, but because it was spiritual, that somehow elevates it above being I mean, it's like futile in a human sense. It's futile in an everyday grounded, this is the real world and people are dying sense. And that doesn't actually come across that strongly to me. But I get, you know, some of the things that they included in the film, what they were going for with that, I guess. But what elevates it or what they're trying to elevate it with is that spirituality or religiosity. And bear in mind, this is Spielberg who did make Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is essentially a Jewish revenge fantasy about killing Nazis using the power of God. So we're not reaching here. <laughs> this is something that is in Spielberg's filmmaking repertoire somewhere along the lines. Um, I know he produced that one and George Lucas directed, but whatever. Um, it's still his other way. Or was it the other way around? Yeah, yeah. Regardless, regardless, I think it was Lucas that directed that one. Yeah, the two of them made that film together, um, and that is what that film is ultimately about. And this is the only other film that he made about Nazis, uh, aside from the three. I mean, the three, the two Indiana Jones films that cover Nazis. Um, so, the notion that this would be some kind of religious quest is that what they were on? Because it doesn't make any sense from a strategic or logistical or straight up military resources point of view or any of that. So why are they doing it? Why do they even go along with it? It's not like anyone's going to, there's no one there to tell them off if they start just ignoring this stupid order that they think. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's too much going on for anyone to really care whether or not they end up finding Ryan. No one's right. in the group yeah. of is even going to notice probably um, if they just decide to like fuck off to Belgium. And, and let it be someone else's problem. No one's going to stop them. So, but they keep going. And they keep going to an end where our quasi-Christ-like leader, the man who's shifting the wheat through the valley of darkness, ends up being sacrificed. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yep. So you, you see where I'm going with this interpretation? I do. Totally, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 
I think that might be ultimately what this film is, because this was the other question that we kept batting back and forth is, what even is Saving Private Ryan? That, even setting aside what Spielberg was trying to do, it's sort of what film did we actually end up with? Yeah, you no. take up there, because I'm rambling about Jesus again. No, I don't want to piss off Christians. <laughs> if I keep talking, you will. Well, like we we, we know it's it, it it can't possibly be considered a historical movie. If if it's a war movie, it's a war movie in in a very specific sense, and not in in anything traditional about the nature of of war films. Um, I do. I think it's. I, I think the you know the the spiritual aspect that you're mentioning that. I think that those those may have been the real beats that they were trying to go after that. And, and of course, you had it was twofold in that way. One, there are lots of people that were wanting to see something that had been said to have additional authenticity, like they had taken a syringe of authenticity steroid and sucked it right into Tom Hanks' ass or something. But we, we have a lot of those. America is filled with history buffs, especially World War II history buffs. And so... You could definitely see it in that way that in terms of a, it could maybe be a war porn or, a, you know, a, a porn, it just, a, just a pornographic depiction of very specific sliced events that Steelberg put together. Um, and then the other half is what exact, I think exactly what you're pointing out here is that the, the religious aspect of it, the, um, you know, we're wanting to save Brian, save his mother to, you know, to meet our understanding of God being supportive of this endeavor, that God was, God was on the side of the allies, that, you know, God understands that things make mistakes and you drop bombs on wrong people and God forgives those things. And, um, yeah, I think, I think that you hit the, hit the nail on the head with, with that part of it. And it, and it does, it leaves ordinary film goers, especially discerning film goers to, to sit and ask it, is it, did fulfill anything in that way other than just a, a propagandistic notion of how the higher ups, how, how the folks at entertainment liaison offices ever want things to be seen in that way. It has to fit into a certain thing, or it's going to upset a certain type of veteran or certain type of film buff or history buff. Um, because they'll, you know, the people will say that I've read all the books on a single subject and I'm like, well. You've read all the books that everyone's written, or you've only, have you only written red books that came from the same point of view that you were already emphasizing? Um, and you just read the other books that those books were based on. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And that's the, like the easiest mentioning Stephen Ambrose is that yes, there's a lot of good stuff in his work, but there's also a lot of other stuff. He was one that, uh, I think he actually lied about being a pen pal with Eisenhower before Eisenhower passed away and wrote a whole thing on that, but it's, it's a very American centric, even for everything that it's honest about for its own authenticity, it's a very American centric view. So, and, and that's the thing is I can see churches having saving private Ryan nights here in the U S I could see that very easily. That would be a, you know, we wouldn't, we certainly wouldn't let the young kids come watch it, but, um, but yeah, that it would fit, uh, perfectly. Uh, in that kind of, in that kind of scenario and fall into the same kind of, you know, typical Protestant evangelical line of thinking about God and war and who we send to war and who's special and who's is, who isn't. And then ultimately what we end up not saying. Okay. So four quick things. One, this whole Lincoln letter thing is making me think of the hateful eight. And Eisenhower mm. fake pen pal. And I, I can only assume that's what Tarantino was playing on. Uh, two, Jack Ryan is the chosen one. Mm -hmm. Three, the only other big emotional beat that lands in the movie is the scene in the church that you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And four, the opening of the film isn't the invasion of Normandy, it's the Jews crossing the sea to get out of Egypt. Sounds right to me. Um, bearing in mind that Spielberg is Jewish and there is quite a lot of biblical symbolism knocking around in his films in one place or in one form or another. So, yeah, the more I think about this, the more this is a film about some kind of Judeo-Christian spirituality that just happens to be set in World War Two. I think of that thing about, you know, the parting of the seas and the walking up onto the sand. I didn't think about that until just now. 
while you were talking. And now I'm not quite sure what to make of it. It just so easily fits into that niche of where people would accept it again, like the, you know, the, there's only limited cursing in it, which is something I, I know I mentioned this earlier, but pe Christians are, it, it's a huge, huge thing in the United States about using cursing. So if you keep all of the violence, whatever kind of violence it happens to be in your film, but you remove or minimize the cursing, you're going to have created a, something that a lot more people would be willing, openly willing to watch, especially if it's like a, you know, a TBS or TNT version that's, you know, made to be 17 hours long with commercials. Um, yeah, it's much more acceptable to the concerned housewives of America or what I call them. Yeah. 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 But they do, they, it ends up being, but it ends up being just, just, you're complaining about window dressing. You know, you're complaining about it. It, it, it is, it's like the, you know, the broken windows policing that they've, they've done in New York city. That yeah. we care about these tiny little things that the big things matter. And, and again, going back to Spielberg again, like you said, is that maybe that was the idea he got in his mind is it's like, I got all these other things together. I just got to hit these specific beats with these specific places, fill in the rest. And we got ourselves a really great war movie. And of course for ordinary people, because it is a very different war film, if we want to call it that that they don't know what they're looking at they're, And of course, I, I, I know for me, like the first time I saw it is the first 25 minutes leave you raw but mentally, just, just trying to take that in. So I, I don't know that I paid as much attention to the movie until the very end for that reason. But again, we, as we talked about, that probably was done on purpose to prime people for the, for the hits, the beats that speed work was going at. Cause it's curious to lack so many of the emotional setup and payoff that should be in the film and yet the moments okay so what the hell in the bible is the wrong jack ryan i'm now playing you know gotcha with myself in terms of bible studies and i'm not actually that okay with oh, no, 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 yes. um, no, I, i've got no idea maybe maybe listeners can make some suggestions as to if that is also supposed to be some kind of religious metaphor or spiritual reference or something what that um, scene is about and why yeah. that scene. You got any ideas? No, e, not, not, not off the top of my head at the moment. Um, there's a fellow okay. e e email us anyone if you've got, cause I am now actually quite interested in this film, having spent the last, what, nearly two hours slagging it off and saying how boring and futile and pointless this movie is. I'm now actually quite interested in it as a religious metaphor. <laughs> hey, no, sometimes it just, it just, it, what is it that you're looking at, you know, mm. and, 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 and you know, I, and, uh, you know, and I, and I want to say, you know, I, I haven't, it's not something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about, but certainly there has to be a, a lot of those other religious beats and other prominent military war films, Black Hawk Down, Forrest Gump, there's a whole, a lot of, a lot of Jesus and religious stuff in there. And, um, yeah, but that's usually quite explicit. True. Yeah. It's not, it's not underlying. It's not just theme with that other, other context. And those films have emotional through lines that make more sense to me. True. Very um, true. They are, they, they do much, much better that way. I rewatched Forrest Gump recently with my son had never seen it. And I, you know, I forget how well made of a film it is. It's really well made in a lot of its aspect. It's still a propagandistic piece of shit in a lot of other ways, but you know, it's like, finely like crafted. Said, the film knows what it is. Robert Zemeckis knew what he was doing and followed it through and it made so much sense than like saving, saving Jack Ryan. But you got me to it. So. I was going to, um, just while I'm thinking about it, uh, Bill, Bill, if you're watching, if you're listening to this episode, Bill's a longtime follower of the podcast and he's also a chaplain. Um, and he does sometimes opine on little things like that. So Bill, if you're listening, you got a chance to email us, please do let us know what you think. Um, like Tom said, uh, mentioned earlier for everybody else, you know, going through these films and understanding them thematically is a lot of layers. And like Tom mentioned, we emailed back and forth for a long time about a whole bunch of different aspects of this film and where it goes, where it leads, where it all goes. So, but yes, please folks take, take the time, send us a line, tell us what you thought of the episode. And if you have any thoughts on the, on the religious themes of it, um, and, uh, and, and, and the symbolism in particular. Yes. I'm yes. now trying to decode this symbolically in my own head, but I may 
you're, you're going to force me to actually watch this film again, aren't you? That was my plan from the start. Evil scheme to make me actually enjoy <laughs> Satan. After having spent probably 20 years not despising this film, just almost feeling nothing towards it. Right, right. I, I'm now actually finding it really quite interesting and provocative. E- even though I'm also staring at one of my notes here that just says music constant to try to justify ludicrous premise. It's the crafting in this film seems to be taking place somewhere other than like in the film. It's not that well made, but somehow no. there's something in it that I missed up until this point. And so now, yeah, yeah. Any anyone who can help me delve more into this and like I say, understand some of the symbolism and some of the biblical allusions and all of that, feel free to get in touch. I mean there's a contact form on my site. You can email Henry and he'll meet he'll forward stuff to me. Whatever. But I am actually now now genuinely curious. I started out, as I say, not despising this film, but feeling essentially apathetic towards it and not really wanting to have this conversation, which is why it's taken us, I don't know how long to actually get to this point of having this conversation. Um, And now suddenly you've turned me around. I don't know how to react to this. This isn't how I was expecting this conversation to conclude. It was with me being more interested in the film than I ever was before. That's just me doing my job, Tom. You know, I'm, I'm, well, you, you, have, you have done an excellent job. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a really good American puppet. So I think, uh, I think we got a really good place to, to wrap up here for today. Um, the, uh, the one thing that I wanted to, to mention again, re-mention for the end of the episode is that for anybody who's seen it and for anybody that watches war films uh, in general, that... Um, Ask yourself as you're watching it, as you're taking it in about the sights and the sounds and how the violence and then those kind of things are impacting the way that you see what's actually happening in the story. Um, remember that filmmakers in these genres, they want you to center on characters very much like Saving Private Ryan. Always tell yourself, you know, you want to look at things certainly from a historical perspective. And you want to remember that a filmmaker's choice to center on an individual, a single, single individual or group of individuals is an effort to get you to narrow your focus on the topic. So make sure you broaden your focus. Make sure if you are one of those people that reads all the books on a subject that you read them from all sides of the political aisle and, and try to understand it more comprehensively. Um, except Rush Limbaugh or Jordan Peterson, you can burn that shit. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, but Tom, any, any final remarks? Uh, only that the, I never got round to it. The best thing on that trip to France, to Normandy, when I was a kid, mm. wasn't actually the beach. It was the Bayer Tapestry. If anyone doesn't know what that is, look it up because it's truly amazing. And if you ever get the chance to go to the town of Bayer and go to the Musée, Musée de la Tapisserie, I think it is, the Museum of the Tapestry, go there because mm. it's incredible. Sounds nothing great. To do, nothing to do with saving Jack Ryan, except that it's in Normandy. <laughs> but yeah, look it up. Buy a tapestry. Seriously, people. I will, I will do that as soon as we get off here. Um, all right, folks. Thank you very much for uh, joining us today on Fortress on a Hill. I hope that the, the discussion was informative. And, and I know that these episodes have, have usually been good ones for us, that, that, that it gives people a lot to think about, especially when, you know, maybe you saw Saving Private Ryan once or twice a long time ago. Um, to, to really understand what its power is in the way that Spielberg and filmmakers like him use that. And especially just American filmmakers in general, using that, that great propaganda tool, Tom Hanks, with his, his smile and his charm and everything in, in whatever way they can. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Money is tight these days for everyone. Penny pinching to make it through the month often doesn't give people the funds to contribute to a creator they support. So we consider it the highest honor that folks help us fund the podcast in any dollar amount they're able. Patreons is the main place to do that. In addition, any support we receive makes sure we can continue to provide our main episodes free for everyone. And for supporters who can donate $10 a month or more, they will be listed right here as an honorary producer, like these fine folks. Fahim's Everyone Dream, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, 
Thomas Benson, Janet Hansen, Ren Jacob, Scott Spaulding, Spooky Tooth, and Helge Burt. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt for some great Fortress merch. We're on Twitter and Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time.